social entrepreneurship is, uh, is really about managing an enterprise with multiple bottom lines, environmental, social, as well as financial. That's what's most exciting about today for me, is that we get people converging and talking and just pushing forward their ideas together. The concept of social entrepreneurialism, which is being discussed here today, which to us is, is simply about uh, encouraging people to come up with new ideas, new approaches to address social problems that we're facing here in Canada. Uh, we're, at the, we're at a point where this is important and, uh, and necessary and with the heat being turned up by the economy on everyone, I think the timing is ripe for this kind of conversation. I just quit a paycheck job to come back to this and, that's, and that is the experience of an entrepreneur. So our particular approach to social entrepreneurship is to look for ideas that have the potential to impact millions of people. Folks in this, this room understand the importance of, of trying to take chances on, uh, on, on people and new initiatives. Clearly social entrepreneurship is a growing uh, trend in Canada and obviously one we would wish to encourage further. So social enterprise is an interesting framing. The reality is uh, people have always been tremendously innovative and creative and entrepreneurial. Our idea is if we can just get a small percentage of those MBAs saying, hey, something matters to me, I believe with profit and purpose, I believe business can do amazing things, then that's how we can make this world a better place. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to CIVC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Um, just to let you know, we've decided that uh, sharp at 5.30, we're gonna launch a video, a short video like that each evening. It uh, gives latecomers a chance to get settled and, and I think you'll find all of these are actually pretty interesting uh, videos about various things that uh, I think are relevant to you and that take place at Mars. We do have a special um, uh, series of slides uh, this evening about an initiative that I think is very, very relevant uh, to you folks. So I'd like to invite Claudia Hepburn, the executive director of The Next 36, uh, to come up and say a few words. And if I press this, there we are, it works. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, I'm the executive director of The Next 36, which is a new program that I hope will be very interesting to you. It's a, going to be an elite program that's based at the University of Toronto, partners with Mars, but is national in scope. And our goal is to promote, uh, is to transform bright, ambitious, entrepreneurial, and driven students into the Canada's next generation of high-impact entrepreneurs. We're looking for 36 of Canada's top students, and we define top by being, having solid academics, um, a track record of entrepreneurial accomplishment, and, uh, and who will be great ambassadors for the program going forward to apply to the program. And we are, this is going to be a very resource-heavy program that is, we hope is going to be, turn out to be something that is a cross between the Rhodes Scholarship and Y Combinator, if any of you know that program, that is going to combine the best of a highly uh, selective um, admissions process to find 36 top students who really are, um, are uh, top caliber in these categories that is going to provide an entrepreneurial exercise, so practice in building a mobile phone app that we're gonna um, provide each student team with $50,000 of resources to, to build this project, and an incredible opportunity to work with some of the world's top academics to study entrepreneurship in the classroom, the academic theories behind it. And embedded throughout the whole program is going to be um, is going to be close connections, work, mentorship, role modeling with Canada's top business leaders and entrepreneurs. Some of the people that are financing the program and who are supporting it are um, push the button. Uh, the people whose names are here. And uh, these people have committed not just financial resources, but a promise to work directly with the students in some way. Uh, so we encourage you to take advantage of this incredible opportunity and apply. And we look forward to uh, welcoming you to the, next, to the first cohort, cohort of the next 36. Our application deadline is coming up soon, so uh, please check out our website and apply. Thanks. So uh, I should uh, mention to Claudia that uh, Claudia d does have some forms and materials out on the desk at the back in case you want to pick them up. 
I think for many people in here, you had them at fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> um, so um, I'd like to uh, introduce you to a colleague of mine, Alison Hewitt, who is the director of social entrepreneurship here at Mars. And Alison and I will be jointly giving today's presentation. Uh, she's heard this uh, probably too many times. She's the director of social entrepreneurship. I'm a chemist, the pocket protector guy. Um, I'm the, you know, I'm responsible for the anti-social and entrepreneurs. Um, before we start the talk, uh, I do have one other piece of housekeeping. I shouldn't forget. There is a best practices workshop, Tuesday, October the 26th from 4 to 7, how to draft a patent application. It's free, but it is very limited attendance. There's about 40 or 48 slots. Um, it is sponsored by and presented by Ogilvy Renault. Uh, that typically sells out. It is free, but uh, we are oversubscribed. Uh, so please go to the website if you're interested. And do me a favor, if you register and then you can't come, do a courtesy to, a call to your colleagues. Let us know. We have a waiting list for that uh, particular um, best practices workshop. Things come up, and I know people can't attend. There's nothing worse than a no-show and an empty seat. It means a colleague of yours who wanted to be there can't be, but you're not. So, and we have your emails. I will know who you are. Okay, enough said. So, um, Alice and I are going to take it easy and sit down and uh, uh, do this as a, as a bit of a conversation. So, business development and entrepreneurship basics. Um, okay, just to put things in perspective, um, how are you sending out the right message about your company and what is it you're, you're trying to do? Well. You have to ask yourself some questions, and I think this is over to you to, oh. uh, to slide these. Why do you want to start your business? So what's your motivation? And you saw in the uh, video that was on, uh, we talked about something called uh, social entrepreneurship. I mean, you're all starting your business to make money, right? And maybe... There's a few of you out there who want to make money and make a difference. Can I get a show of hands? How many people would identify themselves as a social entrepreneur? Oh my God, you warm my heart. Thank you. That is really terrific. And I'm really pleased to see so many of you here. What How many I... chemists are there out there? So. <laughs> Woohoo! Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> We're almost taking over, not quite fit. Um, so I just came from Singapore. There's a social innovation exchange, and there was a group in Singapore. And this 20-year-old uh, stood up. He says, I'm doing my MBA, um, and I want to make money. I really want to make money, but I actually really want to make a difference. I'm not going to go work on Wall Street and then give my money back later. I actually want to live my values. And I said, you could be sitting next to me in Toronto, sort of hearing this all over the world as a global trend. And, and I think if we're thinking about the work we're doing in talent retention to keep the really great folks who think that making money is very important, but also that sustainability about how we have to think about larger issues, those are the talented folks that we want to keep in Canada. So thank you for that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So what resources do you need? What resources do you need? Do you need to work out of your basement? Is that possible? Do you need a corporate office? Or more and more, we're seeing shared spaces. So for the folks in the social innovation space, we have something called a Center for Social Innovation. You can buy a hot desk. You can work out of there for a few hours a month. But you're in an environment with other people. You can share the photocopy or you can share the kitchen. So shared spaces is a really new way of working in this space, and it reduces your isolation instead of being stuck in your basement. And I think that's a model that um, has really been uh, exploited in, say, um, software development. There are many incubators where you, know, you need a desk, you need your laptop, you need a high-speed connection, 
Um, but you can share a meeting room. Uh, and many investors actually have investment inc slash incubators where they take these software development companies and uh, you know, lock them in a room, have lots of caffeine-laced drinks and Cheetos, um, and, and see what comes out. So it, um, it, it is a good model. It doesn't fit certain activities, but it sure helps keep the cost down. Great. How do you fit into the rest of the world? We have lots of people coming to see us who have really great ideas, but it's such a great idea that someone else has been doing it for the past 20 years who just don't know about it. So it's really important to suss out what the environment is already, and it's really important that you think about what is it that you're doing that's unique. So even though it was out there for 20 years, maybe you've got a different spin on it. Maybe you've got a different approach to dealing with this. And you know the, the, the corollary to that is you say, no, nobody is doing that. Maybe there's a good reason. <laughs> uh, in fact, maybe the last three folks who tried in other jurisdictions failed. And so, uh, you know, success everybody hears about, it's harder to learn about failure, but it is just as important to find out, you know, that business model just doesn't work. And, and we've actually had groups come through here uh, that we thought, great idea, and spent a lot of time to discover that for a variety of reasons that none of us have thought of, the business model just didn't work. So um, understanding where you fit in is not only what is the gap, but what's the history out there? And that's a tough thing to learn, but, but you need to do your homework. Great. And so we're going to talk a little bit in, the, in another slide about the, the range sort of from not-for-profit, for-profit, and the whole range. But I just wanted to take a second to talk about something called the hybrid model. Uh, in the UK, there is something called Community Interest Companies, or KICs. In the US, they have a new corporate structure called L3Cs, Low Profit Limited Liability Corporations. In Canada, not so much. What this new space, what KICs and L3Cs recognize is that people want to make money, but they also have an embedded social or environmental mission, a double or triple bottom line. And it's being recognized globally. So part of the work we're doing here at Social Innovation Generation, or SIG at Mars, is to do research on these new corporate structures. And if anybody's interested in that, I'd like to chat with you about it. Just recognize you're a little ahead of the curve. And I will say, if your business is indeed a for-profit business, and I'm an investor, and you turn out to be one of those low-profit uh, entities, don't come in to me and say, oh, well, we really were aiming for a social bottom line. You better declare that up front if you're going to use that as an excuse. Great. So here's a little bit of the spectrum that I'm talking about. So people understand there's traditional charities. And this is a picture of a food bank or a soup kitchen. And generally, they're serving a social need. Great. Government tends to fund that, or you can donate to that. But they don't often have an entrepreneurial component. Then there's sort of non-profits that revenue generate. This is a soccer club. Any kind of recreation activity that you pay user fees to attend, they're non-profit organizations, but they generate revenue. Our sweet spot is the next two spots, social enterprise. So the picture is of a place called Evis Phoenix. Evis Phoenix is a shelter for street kids. But they have an enterprising organization. They train people on printing how to run a printing press, how to work in a print shop. And they work with the printing industry as a way to create talent for entry-level jobs within that sector. They make money. That money then goes back to the mission of the organization. The next group are what we call social purpose businesses. They are absolutely for-profits. An example is Bullfrog Power, absolutely a for-profit organization but their social or environmental mission is one where they use only uh, clean energy. And people pay more money on their um, electricity bill or on their energy bill because they are prepared to accept that they're getting a service that's clean. 
And so there's a new market, people know this, I think, I hope, that's emerging around having these double or triple bottom lines. And we're working with a group called B Corporations. It's a certified B Corporation. That's a set of standards that you would fill out to say that you are, in fact, a beneficial corporation. The next sort of area is corporate social responsibility. And this weekend, we heard a lot about CIBC Run for the Cure. It's really the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundations, but CIBC is very cleverly co-branded it and gets a lot of pickup. This is a fit with their mission. Their mission is to make money as a traditional bank, their which, traditional corporation. Which we, all of us who have bank accounts, know all too well. But <coughs> now you're into the space that I've played, uh, really, is in traditional startup companies where you know, profit is uh, profit and growth is the main uh, focus. Which is not to say that there is not an agreement that five percent of all profits will be, not be donated uh, to things. And you know, the right hand side is probably what we are familiar with. Um, those ones in the middle, some of us who were on the right hand side actually were were attempting to be, I would say, I was running a social purpose business. We just didn't know that was what it was called. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to, I think the key here is the distinction that Allison made. The, every one of these entities is run as a business. Mm -hmm. It's not looking for the next donation or grant. The whole philosophy is growth through making a profit which sustains the organization. And where you sit to the right or the middle of the organization of this chart doesn't really matter. You fit in with the Mars mission. Great. And now Tony's going to talk about types of organizations, starting with consulting. So we've really uh, sort of divided the world into three general areas, consulting, service, and product type businesses. So um, consulting, that's probably the easiest business to get into. Um, you have a unique skill and you sell your services or your, your skill set uh, on a per diem or on a contract basis. Um, often multiple participants bringing multiple uh, skills uh, to a given client. Um, can, sizes can be all over the map. You know, Hatch Associates is very famous. Consulting engineers. That's a large um, organization. And Aperio is a small one here in Toronto that focuses on social enterprises or nonprofits. You know, the, the, if that's the business that you're starting, and you should incorporate, get why in a moment, um, generally a low capital cost. You know, your, your, the investment that you have made in your education and training is really um, uh, what you need. You don't need uh, a lot of capital. Uh, you are portable. Um, and, um, you know, you can do as much or as little as you like. Uh, one of the things, if you are providing people advice, uh, and they are paying you, you should have uh, professional liability insurance because if you turn out to be wrong uh, and they can prove that they have been injured by taking bad advice when they should have expected you to know better, uh, they will come after you, which is why you want to do this through a corporate uh, vehicle as opposed to personal so that your house and all that is not on the line. And there is, we'll cover that in, in another uh, lecture. One of the things, it can be lonely. Um, many groups actually uh, work together as virtual companies. I've seen um, uh, sort of brochures or electronic sites, websites, it looks like, wow, this is a team of 10 people and look at all these skills that they offer. Um, they're all independent. It's just convenient to offer one-stop um, consulting services through one vehicle. Okay, so 
Uh, how many here are actually thinking about going into a consulting business? Okay. One of the questions we often get asked is, well, how much should I charge? The flip answer to that is, how much have they got? Um, but always look at the alternative. And that's true no matter what business you're in. Uh, it's not what it cost you. What would it cost the, the client as an alternative? The alternative as a consultant is, well, they could hire someone with your skill set. Okay, you know, that's a commitment. You know, you hire, uh, if you have to fire the severance, you're looking at paying somebody for, you know, their full time, whereas they only need spot duty. So you need to say, what's the alternative cost? And price yourself somewhere below that. It makes it attractive. So it's not what, well, I charged the last person. Um, what are the alternatives? If you price yourself too high, they'll say, nuts, I'll, I can hire somebody full time for that. And you've just lost a gig. So think of always, and this is true in others, think about the customer's alternatives. And that helps set your price. So. And the next area. Service, and I have to say, you know, consulting, I don't care what you're in. Uh, service in particular, you are serving people and it's got to be service with a smile. I'm old fashioned. Um, so um, here you're serving, you're a business serving existing businesses. You can have a shoe shine business, that's a service business. Um, uh, see, I, the banks are in the service business. They look to expand the services. They can, you know, rather, you know, your alternative is putting your money in a sock under the bed. Better, they offer you a service, they will keep your money. They will lend you money. They will sell you insurance. These are all services that they're business units they're trying to get into. There's a whole new model software as a service. Anybody, how many here know about salesforce.com? Okay, customer relationship management, CRM software. It's all virtual. You don't have to have a, um, a contact list. You put it on salesforce.com. It's not here, it's on a server, who knows where. It's actually somewhere in the States and that for security privacy reasons, that is sometimes a challenge. But it is a service that they offer. In this case, a particular piece of software that you access via the internet. Again, it's, a, it's the service <coughs> business Sorry. in a whole new area exploiting the internet to offer services that you never could offer before so widely, but now are enabled by the, you know, the technology. Um, can, I, can I just say, Tony, well, sure. two things I want to point out. Number one, can you tell CIBC is our sponsor? Because we've used them yeah. three times already. <laughs> um, and, uh, and secondly, for those who are interested in, in the nonprofit space, salesforce.com will give you 10 free licenses uh, as a nonprofit. Um, and it's actually, uh, they have really a very strong interest in this space. They're doing a lot of work in social impact metrics. And Mars itself, for those of you who don't know, is a nonprofit charitable organization, and we use salesforce.com for all our contact management here. Um, one of the classic services are lab services. Um, again, from, from where I come, uh, often in life sciences, you, 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 know, you get a, and, and university groups often do this, you've got an incredible a piece of equipment, analytical equipment. It's used only 20% of the time. You can create a business that's a win-win where you secure other private sector customers to use that. You pay the research team that owns the instrument so they get revenue and you're providing access to that. That works if you don't have to buy the equipment. One of the challenges in, in labs as a service is the capital costs can be huge. Um, in fact, uh, if you are doing um, online, uh, you know, software as a service, 
you got to buy servers. The more successful you are, you have a server farm because people are now relying. You know, if I want to look someone up in my database, I don't want to find that the server is down and I can't find my contact. I need it now. And so that can be expensive. So you are ratcheting up somewhat over consulting in terms of your costs in launching the business. Can talk about uh, a couple of social ventures. So courier services. Well, we all know about FedEx and all those UPS. Um, but in Toronto, there are two uh, unique courier services I want to tell you about. One called Away Express. And they call themselves a social purpose courier. They're a nonprofit charitable organization. They employ people with mental health issues, and they will deliver your package using the TTC. So if it's on the TTC route, they will deliver it that way for you. That's an environmental mission as well. But they chose to incorporate as a nonprofit. Now, a lot of people with mental health issues, because of their medication, they're not very good in the morning. So if you want your package delivered early in the morning, you may not use this service. But these are all the kinds of concessions certain people are prepared to make. In the same token, there's a group called Turnaround Couriers. They hire their bike couriers straight out of shelters, straight out of youth shelters. They decided to incorporate as a for-profit. They were convinced that they could make this model work and make money. So create these jobs, but actually make money. It's a former monitor consultant consultant that's running it, and they pride themselves on never having lost a package, and they deal with many of the downtown law firms. So that's something for you to think about. Big company like Courier, um, like FedEx, big, uh, <clears throat> big competitors, but they found niche markets. One decided to go not for profit, one decided to go for profit. And that's the kind of stuff that we would be happy to work with you at SIGIT Mars to figuring out what would be the right kind of model for you. On the right is a, a guy called uh, my right, your left, uh, John Mighton. John Mighton started an organization called Jump Math, stands for Junior Undiscovered Math Prodigy. Uh, he ended up doing a PhD in mathematics, but all the way along he thought, why am I not getting this? Why am I not getting this? Until he figured out actually it wasn't him, it was how he was being taught. So really challenged how we teach math to kids. He's had some great success. So he came to us, and he had some issues around governance. He was the founder, so you got the whole founder syndrome. What does that mean? Who should his board be? Um, how does he generate revenue through the sale of math books? You know, he's actually a really interesting guy. He said he's got a PhD in mathematics. He's also a, an award-winning playwright, and he was just named to the Order of Canada. So a really interesting guy, but with a whole bunch of different issues. But John is not just what I would call a social entrepreneur. He's a social innovator. He wants to completely change how we educate kids, how we teach math. So I want to encourage you to think about your service as a way to make large systems transformation. And I know I'm putting a lot on you. I just want to plant the seed. And when you think about the kind of gap that you're meeting, how can it actually really make long-term sustainable change? And if you think you've got something really unique that can do that, then I want to work with you. Now, question, the gentleman at the door, who is he? Come on, please, somebody tell me. Salesman? A, is a he's a specific type of salesman. Yep, door to door, A particular going. company, a come brand. on, don't, don't make me feel old. Fuller a fuller brush, brush man, thank you. We had bets that no thank one would you. get it, so thank um, you. <laughs> I feel better that some of you at least knew that. I, you know, I know selling brush. <laughs> products, selling brushes in this case. So, yeah. um, uh, okay, uh, okay, this is very simple. Obviously, product company is a tangible offering. It could be a pharmaceutical co compound. That's a whole business structure area that's very different from RIM. So, you know, what we think of as the major things in our lives, our Blackberries, our cars, um, household goods, product companies. Uh, and probably that's the bulk of what we see in here, uh, which it doesn't mean that they can't be social purpose, but, you know, they want to build an electric vehicle. 
Uh, okay, and we had, again, I'm gonna promote uh, something that's on, I guess it's on the Mars website now. We had a session on the future of electric vehicles. So part of what we want you to think about, yeah, I wanna build an electric vehicle. Do you? Are you selling a car or are you selling a battery? Maybe the way to create a viable business is to sell and recycle batteries because they're a major portion of the cost of an electric vehicle. Let Ford and all those other companies build the shell. Your business is putting the battery in it and then collecting it on a regular basis, recycling. Whole different business model enabled by the concept of electric vehicles. So when, and that's where there's, there's innovation in products, there's also innovations in business models. To me, that's a bit of both. The electric vehicle relies on a, a battery, but to, to make them affordable, you know, it's like buying all your gas for three years up front. You know, you wouldn't do that. So that's a powerful disincentive to uh, electric vehicles. Come up with a cost-effective way of leasing batteries to people. So it's a monthly charge, the same as buying gas. Now there's electricity, but think about business models, and we will again have a lecture about, uh, you know, thinking about the business model, even on something as traditional as a car, um, new technologies sometimes need innovative business models to match the technologies. Okay, often here you have classic development costs. You gotta make a prototype, okay? It can cost you a lot of money to do that because no one is going to um, uh, place orders until they've at least seen a working sample of your product. That typically costs money, it requires a team, you have to get market traction against competition, and all of the things that we normally think about for um, product type businesses. So I think our next slide is, uh, okay, yeah, social venture products. Just a couple. Um, how many people are familiar with Habitat for Humanity? Great, so they build homes and basically people put some sweat equity if you're uh, low income, you actually go and help build this house. But they get a lot of materials donated. They can't use them all, so they've set up something called restores. So when you're renovating your house, you can go to the restore and buy those products. It doesn't have to have anything to do with Habitat for Humanity, but it's related to their mission. You're helping them out by actually going and buying your products from them instead of home hardware. There is um, a mug. That mug is designed by women. Uh, it's a pottery studio. It's called Inspiration Studios. It's women, uh, again, who are transitioning off the street, formerly homeless women. And so they give them the skills in doing the pottery. And if you need to buy some, I don't know, you're all going to your mom's house for Thanksgiving, bring her something from Inspiration Studios, right? You can think about what are the opportunities to actually buy products that will support, that will give a social mission as well as a financial return. Uh, Ties is a, a software that helps link caregivers. It's a, a link between formal and informal care. So if your mom is in Ottawa and your brother's in Vancouver uh, and you're here in Toronto, you can go online and you can share calendaring and other opportunities to support uh, your, uh, your parents or in a caregiver role. And they're doing very, very well as a for-profit social purpose business. And finally, Free the Children is a big organization. Uh, it works with um, people in developing countries. And Me to We is the t-shirts. You'll see us often wearing the Be the Change t-shirts. That money is completely, um, it's used to generate 50% of the income that comes from that goes back to Free the Children. But the other 50% of it is enough for them on the profit side. So these are just a variety of different ways you can make money and make a difference in the product area. So, you know, in two slides there, we have gone from uh, ceramic, a small group making ceramic mud, to General Motors. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key messages here, no matter what the business is you want to create, 
on that very first slide, what are you trying to accomplish? You need to think about, am I gonna take on the world? Is, this, is your business gonna be the next rim in Canada? Or do I wanna create something that's good, that's manageable, um, and makes a good profit, and I'm comfortable, but that's really, I don't wanna go beyond that. There's no value judgment about either one. Your decision there, and that's, you know, that's you are the only ones who can really sort of set that pathway that profoundly influences who you talk to to be your partner, your investor, um, and, and until you're comfortable with that, I really think you need to, to keep working on your own mind uh, about what it is. Otherwise, you will get into situations that aren't going to work because you need to work with people and you have differing visions of where you're going. Classic example, VCs, when they invest, are always looking for an exit, okay? They get in, grow, grow value, get out. If your vision is to stay there running the company forever and passing it on to your children and your grandchildren, you have dissimilar objectives because VCs are not interested in clipping dividend coupons. They wanna sell the company, make a ton of money. That's a model. Again, not saying it's right or wrong, that's the business model. And if your vision is to have this forever in your position, you better be prepared to somehow write a very big check to buy them out. Otherwise, they're gonna sit there and say, no, 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 we're selling the company whether you like it or not. So again, we're gonna get into these and today and other lectures, but to start off at the very beginning, be very clear about what you want to accomplish and then work with people to get there. Do you wanna show the video? That's a good idea. So we'll just 30 second clip for you and see if you can figure out what this yes, person's so, motivation so, is. Leonard, over to you. What can I do for you, Rod? You just tell me what can I do for you? It's a very personal, very important thing. Are you ready, Jerry? I'm ready. Just want to make sure you're ready, brother. Here it is. Show me the money. Show you the money. Oh, no, no, you can do better than that, Jerry. I want you to say it with you, with me, then, brother. Hey, I got Bob Sugar on the other line. I better hear you say it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Show you the money. Not, not show you. Show me the money. Show me the money. Yeah. Louder. Show me the money. That's it, brother, but you got to go. Show me the money. I need to feel you, Jerry. Show me the money. Jerry, you better yell. Show me the money. Show me the money. Congratulations, you're still my agent. <laughs> so his motivation was pretty clear. So that's a perfect segue into forms of showing me the money. Um, gonna assume here, no matter what you wanna do, you're going to need some sort of financing uh, to make it all happen. And so there are some pretty standard um, groupings, if you will. You can borrow money. You can sell a piece of the action, which is basically selling equity in your, your uh, business. Very, very important distinction. And we'll get to, we're gonna spend a little time on that. You can bootstrap, you know, do a little bit, make a little bit of money on that and plow it back in, which helps you grow and it's a virtuous cycle. Self-funding. Um, one of our um, 
um, lived at lectures last year, uh, Michael McCain was talking about McCain Foods. What did he say? Four out of every French fries around the world come from McCain's. Um, they never took a dime of outside money. So bootstrapping doesn't have to limit you to a little thing. You can grow internally. It's often a slower process than taking money from outside, which jump starts you with lots of people, lots of activity. And there are different places where, again, one is more appropriate than the other. So, bootstrapping. Grants. Well, grants sound like they're free money, uh, but they're not. Uh, we often look at government, we look to government to, to fund what we're doing, we look to foundations, and we have some great foundations. The Ontario Trillium Foundation is a huge foundation here in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> The problem is you will apply for a grant and it's a lot of work, you have to fill out a lot of papers and you may say I want a grant that does this. By the time you get into the process you may, need, you may realize that what the community needs and what the best product is, is this, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the gap from there to there is going to be up to you to finance because you've got a grant to do this, whether or not it's needed. So the problem when you think about that is, A, do you have the skills to fill out the grant? Do you have the access to even get in um, to get the application filled out, to get all the right forms, to lot of law, a lot of law? Then you have to do the accountability and you have to follow up on that. But it does not allow you any kind of flexibility. So although we're all in favor of helping you apply for government grants and look at what kind of foundations may be able to support your work, it's really important that you know, although they don't ask you to pay the money back, you're quite restricted by what you're able to do. So bootstrapping, again, is the best way to do it, although none of this is easy. And that's why you're here, to work together to figure all of this out. And I always yeah. refer to um, a lot of government uh, funding as hamburger helper. Make certain you've got the beef. Get the core money. The other you know, foundation or government support can be on top of that. It's a challenge if it's your core money because you are locked into, as Allison said, exactly what they're going to support you. And if you say, it's really over here, at least a financial investor, you can say, hey, you know what? That's where the money is. Let's do it. The official programs say, no, we, we agreed we were going to do this and we're going to do that. And so that's a, that's a challenge. And obviously hybrid models, they're not that, uh, you know, we've presented them as clear distinctions. Um, many companies will take a venture investment, they'll complement that with some venture debt. Uh, once they're operational, you can get bank financing, which is rolling line of credit debt. These are all a mix. These are just a, a, a range of things that you need to consider, and they will differ during the lifetime uh, of your company as it grows. Great. And now Dr. Redpath is going to take you back in time to when you were eight years old and you had a lemonade stand. I want to make it clear the distinction between debt and equity, because a, a lot of people don't understand. Yes, okay, I borrow this, and, and, but this is an investment. The behavior of the two types of sources of money is very, very different. So, um, we're going to assume you had to borrow 20 bucks from your sibling in order to set up a lemonade. You need capital, right? You've got to buy lemons, uh, sugar, a uh, little sign and all that, so you need capital to launch this venture. We're going to consider three scenarios, rain, cloud, and sun. It rains the weekend you've got this out. You only make 10 bucks. Okay, if your sibling lent you the money, they get 10 bucks back. They lost 10 bucks. You got nothing for sitting out in the rain. Debt is top priority. They take the first dollar that comes in. If they instead said, no, I'll come in as your 50-50 partner, so I'm an investor in your lemonade stand, they actually, now you got 10 bucks, you're going to split that. You get five. They've lost 15. 
but at least you got something. In cloud, you made 30 bucks, okay. The lender is even. And obviously this interest, in, don't, this is a zeroth order approximation to this sort of thing. Fundamentally, the lender is capped. You paid back the 20 bucks. If it was debt, you collected 10. Um, if that was an equity investment, you made 15. Your partner still loses five because you split that 30 equally. So they put in 20, they got back 15. They've still lost five bucks. You're 15 bucks ahead of the game. Um, if it's really sunny and uh, there was $50 of revenues, lender is still even, right? They're capped. They got repaid and you made 30 bucks. If it was an equity partner, yeah, the partner makes five, you got 25 out of it. My point here is that in equity, the partner on the right hand side, lose, lose, they only make if the sun shines, okay? So basically, they're looking for a real success. A, a, a lender is whole, even if you're mediocre, they get their money back. It is a more conservative approach. Lenders have lower risk, but lower upside. Equity investors have higher risk, but they have a higher upside. So if we go to the next one, um, this didn't come out as clear. You can't really see the green. Um, I should next time pick a different color. From, from your perspective, actually, um, Oops, I think I've got a, a laser point. Here we go. Um, let's see. Uh, does this? Yes, here we are. Uh, I'm going to turn around. Just point here. From your perspective, you got five, you got 15. Um, you got 25. Who makes the most money? By the time you get over here, it's uh, the, 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 the debtor. You're making more money um, if you took debt. If you're planning on success, take debt. Because the lender is capped. All, everything beyond sun, sun and heat and desperately thirsty that's all to you. Point there is that equity investment is very expensive money at an early stage because an investor shares forever in whatever you make. So lots of people come in and say, wow, yeah, I want an angel investor. I want to go to a VC. Um, that's fine. And obviously that's, uh, that's sometimes the only way, but when you give away a piece of your company, it's forever. And on that upside, they share in all of that upside. That's their reward, because on the other slide, right, they were taking the higher risk. If, um, if things were not a success, they lost much more than, than the lender would. So, so keep that in mind when you're looking at the two choices. And the other thing to think of is that when you take on a partner, they have a say. So when it's raining out there, your sibling is saying, get your tail outside. I don't care that it's raining because I'm losing money when you're not out there. So we're partners in this and your job is to get out there and sell. Debtors don't have as much control because their priority in getting money, the quid pro quo is no, they don't tell you how to run your business uh, within constraints. You can't do ridiculous things. It's covenants in a, in a, in a loan agreement, but um, they can't sit there and say, no, I don't care how uncomfortable you are. You got to get out there. And that's, that's what a partner has the right and expectation to be able to do. So, so. So where can you get debt financing? <clears throat> well, you get it from yourself, right? You start saving now. 
debt. We've talked a lot about debt. Family, friends, and fools is a term that Tony uses. The three Fs. <clears throat> the three Fs. Government, we've talked about grants. And then the last one is about crowdsourcing. So if you think about how Obama financed uh, his campaign, lots of people giving li little bits of money. And what it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was just going to pick up on this. The U is very important. We've, one of the hats I wear is, is part of an investment fund, and I have been a VC investor, and I say I'm a recovering venture capitalist. Um, people come in and say, I want you to invest in my business. So you say, well, how much have you put in? Have you mortgaged your house? Oh, no, that's far too risky. I wouldn't do that. Well, why the hell do you expect me to put my money at risk or the money I'm managing on behalf of someone else? You know, it's called skin in the game. If you're not willing to take a risk and invest your money uh, to the extent that you can, early stage entrepreneurs don't have, you know, typically, a lot of assets that they can borrow against. But if you haven't put something in, anybody that you're asking money of is going to say, why not? Um, and I haven't yet heard a good reason um, uh, that has convinced me. So the you is important. And I was thinking about this last night uh, after we, you know, after I'd seen the slide, the crowdsourcing. You know, a source of quasi-debt financing is your customers. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to show my age here. Does anybody remember Mel Hertig and the Canadian Encyclopedia? Okay. Mel Hertig is a very, very innovative man. Does a lot of great things. He wanted to publish the Canadian Encyclopedia. Publishers don't have a lot of free money floating around. So he pre-sold it. He went out and got folks like me to send him a check for a hundred bucks um, and promised that he would deliver an encyclopedia at some time in the future. Effectively, I lent him money. If he'd gone belly up and hadn't uh, managed to actually produce a product, I would have been out a hundred bucks. So effectively, he borrowed from his customers to get enough money and then smartly said, well, look, all these people have basically invested in this project by giving their money. And that helped him raise the rest of the money so that he could indeed uh, publish the Canadian Encyclopedia. And in due course, I actually got my copy. So it was a good investment. So hey, that's effectively, that, I mean, as I thought about it, you know, I lent him money with absolutely no security. Talk about stupid. Um, but it was a very clever way of borrowing from his customers. So you think about it, you can borrow from a supplier. Lots of small companies, and so you do that in partnership. Most suppliers with a new company are going to say, I want 50% accompanying the order before I'll start making your, your, your key components and that. And then the other 50% is due net 30. Well, you know, when are you actually going to get revenue from those products? I mean, good luck if you get it net 90 and that. So you've got a huge financing gap. You can go to them and say, hey, why don't you produce that and give it to me uh, on terms, I'll pay you net 120. Quid pro quo, I will sign that you are my supplier for the next X years. If they're smart and they say, this is a pony I want to ride, this business is going to grow, I want to lock in my relationship. If they're big enough, they may actually do that. They may laugh at you, but again, you know, that's effectively borrowing from your supplier because they're fronting the money, which is as good as a loan, um, in exchange for the right to participate in the future. So um, it's not selling off a piece of the company, but it's, uh, it's, it's building on a relationship. So that's a creative way of doing debt financing. So it's not just the classic ones. And 
Never, ever, ever go to your bank expecting them to lend you money because this is such a wonderful idea that you're sure to make money in the future. Um, banks don't do that. I have my retirement money in banks. So I'm damn glad they're not doing it for a bunch of crazy entrepreneurs like you because <laughs> I don't want to lose my retirement money. Their job is to give me a reasonable amount of interest and protect my money. It's not the bank's job uh, to, uh, to lend money against um, crazy schemes. They will say, no, you need equity. Or go to the three Fs. Love money is, uh, you know, friends, family, and fools, which can be equity. You know, they have other reasons for giving you money. Uh, you know, people criticize the banks, and it's not just because CIBC is a sponsor. I've actually been there in my early days when I didn't understand this. Could not understand why the bank wouldn't just lend me more for my company. It wasn't their job to do that. I was not making a reasonable request. So, um, equity. Yours? Friends, family, and fools, don't be bashful. Just remember the turkey principle. If you borrow from your family, and it's Thanksgiving, if you have lost their money, there are two turkeys at the table. <laughs> Okay, one is being sliced up with a knife, the other is being sliced up verbally. Uh, okay, it's a, double, it, it's, it's a source of money that, that should trust you and want to help you. It can be a double-edged sword. For, that, for some, sometimes people won't go that way because the potential cost is in, in family and social uh, uh, issues is just too damn high. But, um, if you've got a rich uncle, don't be bashful. Angels, who sometimes prefer to be called high net worth individuals, often what you want is an entrepreneur who has created and cashed out of a venture in your area and um, they want to invest back in and they're comfortable. And uh, I just realized we got to speed up. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to speed up. They can add valuable hands-on. There's some links. Again, lots of folks on Mars can hook you into the angel community. Maple Leaf Angels is a local group. VC funds, you know, they're basically groups. Uh, professional investors. We will have a particular session with some VCs who will really tell you what they're looking for, what makes them tick. Special financing. If you're at a university in the research lab, uh, NSERC, um, CIHR have uh, special uh, grants for um, commercialization of academic-based innovations. Uh, NRC IRAP uh, is, again, uh, federal money that will help companies develop new technologies. Foundations. And there's quite a lot of foundations. There's huge foundations in the US. And excuse me, sometimes they grant in Canada. But uh, there's you know, donations. There's the revenue generation we've talked about. And then there's places like foundations. Uh, Tony's going to whip through the I'm going to whip through cycle. a bunch of slides here. What you're doing is following all these curves. You're moving from a concept to a startup, growth company, and then an expansion scale. Obviously a simplification. The key thing is you're moving down that green curve, which is the risk curve. When you start, it's extremely high risk. It's unproven idea, don't know if the market's there. I don't know if you can actually execute. You need investment. It will generally be small to start with. As it is de-risked, then you can attract more and more money. And actually, it starts to get more and more expensive as you're launching your business. So the yellow curve goes up. And somewhere in there, the red curve starts with revenues. Unfortunately, what often happens is the next slide, revenues look like that. They're slow, they don't really grow, which is when 
your uncle starts saying, wait a minute, this isn't what you said would happen, or your VC investor. This is when you say, maybe a boot, if this is what's likely gonna happen, maybe bootstrapping is the way to go, and that's the next slide. That says the investment matches the growth of the business, okay? Um, samples where it's either get big or go home. If you're selling, if you're launching something in um, the, the cell phone business, that technology turns over so quickly, you can't afford to say, I'll develop my idea over the next four years and grow slowly. By the time you've got to where you want it to be, the rest of the world will be that much further ahead of you because it's a very rapidly evolving space. That's a case where I would say, get a VC, get a lot of money and hit it hard to capitalize on an idea while you can and then stay ahead of the pack because that pack is moving very, very quickly. So again, your choice of funds and the amount varies depending on the sector that you're in. Um, so, and I don't care whether your social purpose or profit um, purpose, investors and your backers are really concerned about risk. This is a game of risk management. So the next slide, what are those risks? We put them down as four. You know, we're assuming, because you're here, this is mostly technology-based. Even social-based innovation is, is driven by a technology that enables you, the internet, to reach out to many people. So, technology risk, does it work in simple terms? Most of you are starting. You don't know if that's gonna work. The second thing, intellectual property, can you protect it? And again, that's probably more relevant to the more for-profit, technology-based companies, but not only does it have to work, but you don't want the big guys saying, thank you, that's a cool idea. We'll do that, and we got way more muscle than you do. If you don't have some way of blocking them, some sustainable technological edge, all you've done is make them aware of an opportunity and they'll capitalize. And I think our last slide is, um, so it works and you can protect it. And now this is relevant, I think, no matter what your business, does the market care? Really, I know you care, you've convinced your rich uncle, but does the market care? Or is there somebody, as Allison said at the beginning, is somebody else already doing it that you weren't aware of? Or have people failed that you weren't aware of? So there's a huge risk about the marketplace. And then the last one is key, no matter what venture you're launching, can you do it? Can you run the team? Do you have the skills, either yourself or in your team, to actually execute on this? Or is it great intent and it's fumbled? We see many, many entrepreneurs who are self-limiting. They can grow a business to that size, they're not smart enough to move aside and let someone else come in, and they trip over their own selves. And you say, you know, this will never get beyond a four-person company. And you say, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna spend any more time the founder is their own worst enemy in cases like that. So can you execute and deliver on your vision? And that's a huge risk and fundamentally, no one really knows until you try doing it. And a couple of things I just wanted to say about this social venture, and we're sorry for running over a little bit here. There's really a concern in your, when you're in this hybrid space between the sort of for-profit and not-profit, there'll be mission drift. You're gonna go to where the money is and so that your priorities will be focused and your resources will be allocated there and you'll lose focus on your mission. The language is really foreign and in, the, in an emergent space like the uh, social innovation space or the social entrepreneurship space, it's hard to get funders to get you. They get charities and they get corporations and when you're trying to do both, we're working really hard to work with funders to get them to get it but it's really hard. A, a quick example, 
we had someone who was in front of Business Development Bank, and uh, they said, okay, so we're going to give uh, we're going to give 90% of our proceeds to the charity, and we're going to keep 10%. And the bank said, great, you're keeping 90%. And they said, no, we're giving away the 90%. They go, great, you're keeping 90%. Like they were <laughs> unable to even hear some of these concepts. So this is an emergent field, and we're really happy to uh, work with you as we figure all of this out. But it's another area of risk you have to think about as you're thinking about that. So we're already over, but do you want to take some questions or? Okay, and so I do up. apologize. We really are going to try and keep this to uh, yeah, the time. You know, finishing by 6.30 with questions. We will always, ourselves and with the speakers, be willing to stay after for one-on-one -on -one, one questions, um, but why don't we just move to sort of one-on-one -on -one questions uh, uh, tonight. Thank you. Thank you all very much.